Hello there, everyone. Welcome back to AP Psychology with me, Miss Baines, your teacher, as I roll out the content for you, my AP Psychology students, for the very first time you see and hear them. So while I'm doing the talking, you should be filling up your binder notes. Make sure you write down everything I say and do not rush. I want you to realize the power of the pause. Right? Take advantage of the fact that you can pause me and rewind me. Stop me from talking and write down what I'm saying. Even if you think it makes sense, if it feels like it makes common sense, elaborate upon it. Make up mnemonic devices. Think of ways to remember the material. Trust me, by doing all of the hard work now, it will pay off for tomorrow's activity and then for the subsequent quiz the day after that. Go ahead and grab those multicolored flare tip pens, get yourself in a nice, comfy, cushiony space, and don't forget those ever important binder notes that accompany today's video, which is Unit 3, Video, Vision, and Hearing. I'll see you on the other side. Okay, welcome back. So the video that we're doing now is for vision and hearing. We're gonna start off with the parts of the eye. Vision actually works, okay? So let's start with the different parts of the eyeball. We're gonna start from the outside and work our way in, okay? This picture here is a picture of the side view of an eyeball. So as if we like cut the eyeball in half and we were looking then right into it, we're getting a side view at the inside of the different layers going forward, okay? So let's start from the outside and work our way in. The very first section we're gonna talk about is the cornea. The cornea is a thin, transparent, or clear covering of your eye. Think of it as kind of a shield. It's there to protect the inside of your eye. It's meant to keep out dust and debris and all that kind of thing, but if you scratch it, Right? If you scratch it with a little piece of sand, it can be quite painful. The pupil is the next part that we're going to talk about. Okay, the pupil is the black part of the eye or the center part of your eye when you're looking at a person. It's that black hole in the middle. That is actually a hollow opening or a hole of sorts. This is where outside light enters into your eyeball. And so the pupil is basically just a hole. That's all it is. It's a hole for allowing light in. We talk about the pupil constricting or dilating, meaning it either gets larger or smaller depending on how much light. That sizing mechanism is controlled by the iris, which is the colored part of your eye, whether you're a blue-eyed person, a brown-eyed person, or so on. This is the muscle that allows your eye to let light into your eye. So it actually makes our pupil opening smaller or larger depending on the amount of light in that space. If you're in a space that's very bright or a room that's very bright, your pupils are going to get really, really tiny because it doesn't need to bring in very much light. However, if, it's a, if you're in a dark room, your pupils are going to get really, really wide because it needs any light that it can find in order to make sense of your surroundings. Okay, so the next part here is the lens. You see it here. It's right there. Just think of it as you would like the lenses of a pair of eyewear or glasses that you put onto your face. The lenses of your glasses are going to help you to focus your vision correctly, right? And that's exactly what your lens does on your eye. It focuses the light onto your retina. The lens also has a very special duty in that it flips an image or whatever we are seeing upside down. And so that when we take an image in, to our eye, it gets flipped back upside down so that our retina and then the retina sends that information into our brain. The next part is the actual retina. The retina is the back of the eye back here, okay? Think of it being as a sort of little mini projector and the lens is gonna project that image onto our retina and this is where all your visual sensory receptors are right, your neural receptors. These here are called the eye's rods, and these over here are called the eye's cones. We're gonna talk about those two in a moment, but this is also where transduction happens, okay? Transduction is an important word, and I want you to make sure you write it down. Transduction is the idea that when we are taking external sensory stimuli into our eye, 
the external stimuli, in this case, is light, right? Our body is going to transfer it or transduce it. Transduce, transduct, transfer. It's called transduction, right? So it's going to transfer those neural messages and transform that light into neural messages. And this happens on the retina as well. The part of the retina that is called the fovea, which is all the way back here. It's this little bump right here. This is the central point of focus. That is where most of our eye cones are. They all kind of get clumped around that fovea because it is the thing that determines how much light gets in and out. We'll talk about what that means in a little bit, but right near is the fovea. Okay, right next to it, the next part is our optic nerve. The optic nerve is this yellow piece here. It is what is physically connecting your eyeball to your brain. Okay, so the information gets transduced or transformed and the neural message then gets sent up via the optic nerve and then the brain gets receives the message. That message first goes to the thalamus, which if you remember with the endocrine system is our sensory control center, right there next to the pituitary gland in our most inner brain. Then the message goes to our occipital lobe, which has our visual cortex at its center. And that visual cortex processes the information that we're getting. Finally, over here, we have our blind spot. The blind spot is over here in the back where the optic nerve connects to our eyeball. There are no receptors here because it needs a tiny but important little spot to connect somehow so that your eyeball doesn't fall out, right? It has to connect so that all the parts fit together. And as a result, you can't see in that area right there where it's connected. Here's a fun fact. What's really crazy is that our brain actually just fills in our blind spot for us. It fills it in with whatever it buys. So if it's the color blue, we fill in the color blue. This is like the concept of closure that we learned about. Our brain does not like to have empty spaces. It works on filling in that incoming information. Tomorrow, we're gonna test our blind spot, but I can tell you now, it's pretty cool, okay? So let's talk about how we actually perceive images, all right? So when we think of light, you can think of it as a them, okay? Them being light waves that come in through the eye. Okay, well think of these waves in the same way that you use the term when you speak of the ocean or say a wave pool. I'm guessing you've all gone to the water parks at some point in your life and went into something called a wave pool. Okay, so think of it like that. So Q or the color of light is coming in is going to be based on a wavelength. Okay, the wavelength is the distance from one peak to the next peak of another wave. Okay. The wavelength is the distance between the two peaks, right? So how high they get. So if you're in a wave pool, it would be like measuring the top of this wave over here to one wave over here, okay? And the distance between those two peaks, that is the wavelength. A wavelength that is shorter, you can see that, right? A wavelength over here that is shorter is going to be bluish in color. The longer the wavelengths are, the more reddish in color they're going to be. Here's a better visual to kind of show you about this. Here's our short wavelengths over here. See how we have those bluish violet colors in there? And then the long wavelengths over here, you see the wavelengths are much reddish in color for the longer ones. Okay, so that is how we perceive different colors. Right? The intensity or the brightness of the light is determined by a measurement called amplitude, right? Amplitude of the wave. So it's kind of a measurement of how tall those waves really get, right? So is it a six foot wave in the wave pool and you're an inch away? You'll be like, ah! <laughs> or if it's a six foot wave and it's all the way down there, right? Either way, it will mean that wave has more energy, right? We have more reason to be afraid of our bodies because there's more water rising and falling. And that would be represented in seeing through brighter color. If we have a low amplitude or a short wave, it's going to be a dull color and not too bright because there's not much energy going on in there, right? There's no energy in its wavelengths. Okay, so let's talk about the two different types of seeing, or the technical terms for 
sightedness. People can have normal vision, right? So our lens focuses on an image on the retina here. But if you are nearsighted, which is also called myopic or myopia, which is important for you to learn, you can see objects that are close up easily, right? No problem. That's why it's nearsighted. But those far away objects are the ones you have issues with. It hinders you from seeing like a movie from the back seat of a movie theater. Or you'll have issues with trying to drive, right? When you're driving a car and there's all of those things that are happening off in the distance, you might not be able to read a sign or a turn and not know where to go. So nearsighted is happening because of the shape of a person's eye. Someone who is nearsighted, like me for example, we have an elongated eye. So here's a typical picture of an eye that has nearsightedness. In a nearsighted eye, you have an elongated eye. And what's happening is this image is actually focusing as it hits the retina because you can't see it well. You can see pretty close up easily, but those things that are far away are difficult to see compared to, say, this normal visioned person over here. Okay, so if nearsighted means you can only see objects that are close or nearby, then the other one is farsightedness, which is its complete opposite. A person who is farsighted can see objects that are far away, but have trouble with those close-up activities like reading. Okay, it's because those near objects are short or out of focus, and because our eye is shortened, this is called hyperopia. Okay, so myopia is nearsightedness, and this hyperopia is farsightedness. So this is the shape of a farsighted eye. Again, here's a typical eye over here, and the farsighted eye. It's taller than it is wide, okay? And what's happening is the image that is being projected onto the retina is focusing, okay? So this behind the eye, okay? You can't see those things that are very close up easily. And here's an example over here. Here's the far away objects that are pretty clear, and then the nearby objects are blurry compared to someone with normal nearsighted vision here, okay? Let's talk about the retina, because that seems to be where everything is happening, right? Okay, so the retina is made up of an inner surface of our eye, which are called cones and rods. Okay, cones go first. Cones are going to be the things for color, okay? They help you to see color. Cones, color, color, cones. That's how you remember it. They also help you pick up fine details of whatever it is that you're looking at. Okay, rods are more light sensitive, and so they're going to be able to help you to see in the dark, and they have to do with black and white night vision kinds of things. But cones are gonna be the way of perceiving color. Our retina is also made up of layers of other neurons called ganglion cells and bipolar cells. Okay, not bipolar disorder, bipolar cells. These process all of the visual information for us between the eye and the brain, okay? So these neurons, they process whatever is coming through the eye, whether it's light, color, shapes of things, and these cells send those messages up to the brain. So what happens when we are seeing something is that the light enters through our eye, through our pupil, it goes to the back of the lens, gets flipped upside down, and goes very far back to the retina. And then it comes up in through here, gets shot all the way to the back, back, back of the retina over here, where the cones and rods are located, and then this photoreceptor cells, okay? Then they, the photoreceptor cells, then get sent up a little bit forward to the bipolar cells, then to the ganglion cells, which sends the message up then to the brain. So it goes all the way up here, through your eyes first, to the back, goes up to the bipolar cell, to the ganglion cell, through the brain, and voila, okay? That's how it works. And the fovea, which is, remember, the fovea is the central part of the retina. This is where your cones are located, which makes sense because it's how we can see the fine details and things, and where you can see lots of different colors. Tons of details, tons of color. When you're looking directly at something, right? It's your peripheral vision that you can't see a lot of detail and color. That's because all of your cones are in or right around your fovea, and your rods are on the outsides. 
So these here are for color and your night vision, okay? Think about why that is. Why is your pupil dilating or why is it contracting? Why is it getting smaller or larger depending on how much light is hitting it? This is an important question, okay? If you can understand this, and you can understand a lot about how the human eye works, or all mammals' eyes, really. So when our pupils dilate, it opens up or it gets larger when we're in a dark room because we are trying to get any little bit of light we can to come in and welcome it in to see those rods, right? We have more light coming in. We need those rods to be able to determine the information that's around us in the dark so our pupil dilates it gets larger to let more light in and expose more rods okay this also allows us to see a little bit less color right think about that your night vision when you're trying to see things out in the dark you're not seeing great color depiction right but you can see the images you can see the contrast of things our photoreceptors and our rods are sensitive to light cones are sensitive to color and fine detail so in this image, we can see here, that's our, right here, these are our cones, okay? See that cone-shaped cone connecting directly to the bipolar cell, then to the ganglion cell? Why do you think that is? Well, it's because we can see more details with them. So we can get a lot more information from this one cone, then it goes directly to the bipolar cell and directly to the ganglion cell and up to the brain because they are just different types of neurons, right? They're different types of neurons with neurotransmission that's a little bit different from the one we talked about. This is just like that, but instead of making our brains tell our bodies to walk or move or talk or move our mouth, it tells our eyes that it has to see and that process, what it's attempting to see each time as it focuses. However, there's about three rods per one bipolar cell, and so they have to share it. And they're not getting quite as much detail from these rods because they have to share one bipolar cell. That is pretty technical and a little bit tricky, but super important, right? It comes up on the AP test several times over the last few years. Cones and rods, bipolar and ganglion cells or neurons. Okay, so let's look at them specifically now. Bipolar cells receive the message from the photoreceptors, meaning the rods and the cones. They then transfer them to the ganglion cells. The ganglion cells form the optic nerve, okay? And the optic nerve, remember, is what sends the messages directly to the brain. Cones each have their own bipolar cell to get more information rods through. Have their own bipolar cell. To get more information rods though, they have to share their bipolar cells. There's about three rods per bipolar cell, okay? You're probably thinking, didn't she just say this? Well, it's just a little bit of a review, okay? It's important, so we're just looking at it like a little more closely. Finally, let's talk though about feature detectors. Feature detectors are special cells in our visual cortex. They respond to features such as edges, angles, length, and width, movement, okay? So we have very specific cells that look just for the edges of objects and mass and it, how things take up space in our world. It literally lets the eye look for the angles of things. They look for the length, the width of things, or they look for movement, which are called feature detectors. So when we see, say, a dog, or a cat, or a mouse, or a bird, or a fish, or an insect, or an amoeba with a microscope, our feature detectors work that out with our brain to make sense of what is what. Which angles, curves, turns around the object make up the particular shape of whatever it is that we're seeing. There are very special feature detectors that are specific to the human face. If you remember back to the biological bases unit, we would talk about the split brain, right? How they're probably located in the right occipital lobe because that's the inside of our brain that recognizes people's faces. So these are feature detectors. Think of these as specialized neurons or brain cells for very specific or certain images. It's how we can tell one person from another. How we use these feature detectors simultaneously. The cool part about all of this stuff is we use these feature detectors simultaneously. In other words, it's called parallel processing. The brain divides the information up into color depth, form, and movement. However, we process all three of those things, all of that information at the same exact moment in time.
So when you're looking at an object, you're not just seeing the edge first and then going slowly, slowly. No, it's doing it all simultaneously, all at once. And that's called parallel processing. We call it this because of all the things are happening in tandem with each other at the same exact time. Okay, so we're gonna finish our discussion of vision by talking about the different theories of color vision. But we're going to go ahead and do that on the second part of this video, part two, where we'll also get into everything about hearing. Okay, so that's it for this video. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.